Now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome immediate past president and 30-year MDRT member, Scott Brennan. Good morning, and happy Valentine's Day. Welcome to another full day of information and motivation, the MDRT way. Remember, this afternoon we will also have a full schedule with two workshops and the MDRT Connection Zone, a great place to network, meet, and learn from MDRT members. Please check your schedules to make sure you don't miss a thing. You know, in the financial services profession, referrals are a vital source of new business. That is why we invited Bill Cates, a recognized expert in building a thriving referral-based business, to speak with us this morning. Bill's books, Get More Referrals Now and Don't Keep Me a Secret, have revolutionized the way financial professionals acquire more clients and better clients through referrals. His latest book, Beyond Referrals, is a groundbreaking next step in client acquisition strategies. Get ready to take notes and please welcome Bill Cates. Thank you. Thank you. Raise your hand if your parents had children. That's my alertness test, first thing in the morning. Think back when you were 9, 10, 11 years old, growing up in your neighborhood. Anybody sell anything door to door growing up in your neighborhood? Yeah, most of us did, right? I was a Cub Scout, 9 years old, and there's Cub Scouts and different types of Scouts all over the world. And we needed to raise money for our pack, so somebody decided we were going to have a sales contest. We had the incredible privilege of going door to door in our neighborhoods selling light bulbs. Pretty exciting product, huh? And a, and a little Cub Scout that sold the most light bulbs in five days would win a brand new shiny royal blue 26 inch 10 speed bicycle. Boy, I was so excited. I wanted to win that bicycle. But I had the first kid in my neighborhood to have a, a 10 speed, right? So I got so excited, I ran downstairs to my mother's laundry hamper and got some clothespins and up to my father's dresser and got some playing cards. And I put those cards and clothespins out where I could see them every day to visualize my success. What was I going to do with the cards? Put them on the spokes, right? Four in the front, four in the back, my motor. <laughs> July 16th, 1960, the light bulb samples arrive. And there's Billy Cates dressed up as a nightly, nicely pressed uniform, right? Trimmed in gold, oh, gold kerchief. I have light bulb samples under my arms, order forms under my arms. My mother pushes me out of the front door like a mother bird pushes the baby out of the nest on their first flight, cold calling door to door. You know, usually growing up in your neighborhood is a pretty friendly place till you start to sell something, right? Went up one side of the street, no luck, no sales. Down the other side, no luck, no sales. Starting to get a little discouraged. And I was afraid to knock on the next door. I was terrified to knock on the next door. That's where Mr. Bill Wilkes lived. Friends of my family, but to me, the ogre of the neighborhood, the monster of the neighborhood. Do you have an ogre growing up in your neighborhood? Yeah, we all did. And ours was Bill Wilkes, because his house was at the end of the street. At the end of the street in the US, sometimes we call it the dead end, right? Next to the dead end. We played a lot of baseball on the dead end. Third base was on his property. And he didn't like that because it messed up his grass, right? We never had to worry about what inning we were in. We just kept track of runs. Whoever had the most runs when Mr. Wilkes came home from work won the game, right? So I was hoping Mrs. Wilkes would answer the door. Knock, knock. Large shadow fills the doorway. Mr. Wilkes. What are you doing there, Billy Cates? Uh, uh, I, I'm selling furnace filters for the Cubs, uh, uh, light bulbs for the Cub Scouts. You don't want one, do you? Pretty good closing line, huh? I don't know, might take a few. Come on in, let's see. Ah, oh, the ogre of the neighborhood was being nice to me. Sat me down, ordered two cases of light bulbs. My first sale. I was excited. I was going to win that bicycle. And then he asked me a question that I'll never forget. So Billy Cates, 
go door to door. Cold calling, that's not an easy thing. Tell me, son, what's your closing ratio? Let me put this way, Billy Cates. How many houses have you been to? How many sales have you made? Um, let's see, 10 houses, my first sale. 10%, not bad for cold calling. Would you like to do better? And of course I did. I wanted to win that bicycle. I got my first sales training at the age of nine, selling light bulbs door to door in my neighborhood. Turned out to be a very successful salesperson, Mr. Bill Wilkes. And this is what he told me. Billy Cates, when you're done here, go across the street to the D'Angelo's. Tell them I sent you there. Tell them I bought two cases of light bulbs and ask them how many they want. When you're finished with them, find out who their neighbor is and keep repeating the process. I was so excited. I finally had a strategy. So I ran across the street and knocks on the door and Mrs. D'Angelo answers the door. Hi, this is Billy Cates from up the street selling light bulbs for the Cub Scouts. Uh, Mr. Wilkes just bought two cases and he said I should talk to you. How many would you like? A little better, huh? She bought two cases. Sent me next door to the Yee's. Yee's bought two cases. Murphy's bought two cases. Terman's bought two cases. I was selling light bulbs nonstop for five days and I want a new set of wheels. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I tell you that not to brag, but that was my, obviously my first lesson in referrals and the beginning of a very long mentor-mentee relationship between little Billy Cates and Mr. Bill Wilkes, the ogre of the neighborhood. <laughs> I learned a lot from Mr. Wilkes. He was the first person to introduce me to that great book, uh, Think and Grow Rich. Napoleon Hill calls burning desire the starting point of all achievement, right? If you want to be successful in business and personal, whatever you want to do, you have to want it bad enough, right? And it's the burning desire, that desire to be successful is what takes you through the rough times when you hit the rocks and the bumps. Well, I assume you have a burning desire because you're here at the MDRT experience and you have that desire to be successful. And you have a burning desire to be successful with referrals and personal introductions and we'll see. But a burning desire isn't enough. He also taught me about the power of belief and how our beliefs the belief in what we do and how we serve people is so important. You and I walk around with limiting beliefs, mistaken beliefs that often restrict our success. And I want to tell you something. I have so much respect for what you do. First of all, you do important work. You know that you provide families and individuals with financial dignity. Do you not? That's an important calling, I think. You get paid pretty well to do that, as well you should. And one of the main things I respect about what you do is you get a chance to learn every day about yourself, don't you? Every day you come face to face with yourself and your issues around success and failure and acceptance and rejection. What you do is not easy. This is not an easy profession. But that's what makes it great, right? If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Right? So having the right beliefs in place the belief in yourself, the belief in your product, the belief in the work you do, the belief in the company that you work for is fundamental to your success. You are sitting on a gold mine of opportunity. People who are happy with you, the work you've done for them, and now it's time to think about leveraging that opportunity a little bit. So let's, real quick, just go through the benefits of working from introductions, personal introductions and referrals. First of all, it's easier to reach people, is it not? It's hard to reach people these days. And so when we've been referred to them or introduced to them, now we have someone who's likely to reply to our email or respond to our voicemail. You start out at a higher level of trust, do you not? Referrals are borrowed trust. We borrow the trust in one relationship long enough, long enough to earn our own trust in that new relationship. And from that level of trust, everything gets easier. Colleen Francis yesterday afternoon talked about trust is not an easy thing to, to, to build quickly, but we do what we can, right? The sales cycle is usually shorter. The average sale is usually larger. Limmer in the United States did a study that said that the average case size of a client that comes into a practice through a referral is twice that than a client that comes in through another methodology, right? So you want to double your income? Start working for referrals and introductions. Every part of your process works better and referrals beget referrals. Studies have shown that when a client comes into our business, through a referral, they're two and a half times more likely to give a referral. It makes sense, doesn't it? And over a period of time, it starts to take on a life of its own. It gets easier and easier and easier, and it's certainly a more fun way to do business. But everyone has a referral gap, 
right? A gap between where they are and where they'd like to be in terms of their referral, right? Are, maybe you're not getting enough new clients. Maybe you're not getting the right kind of clients. I had uh, one of your colleagues came into my booth where I was signing books yesterday and said, how do I get referred to the higher level people in the organization? Maybe, you know, you're not getting referrals without asking for them. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. And maybe you're just not confident in your process, right? You've got to have a process. You've got to be confident. And what is your gap costing you, right? There's a cost to, to not producing as many referrals as you'd like to. So let's do a little math real quick. What is your cost per lead? What is your cost per opportunity? Every business person, every salesperson needs to know what it costs in dollars and times to get in front of a prospect. Right? That's how you can measure your success. What is the cost for advertising? What is the cost for direct mail? What is the cost for cold calling? <laughs> now you may be thinking, well, cold calling doesn't have a, a cost, but it does. Because when you're on the phone making cold calls, you're not spending your time using more effective methods. And so there's a cost there as well. Please remember this, that cold calls are your punishment for failure to get enough referrals. All right? So what does it cost for referrals? Nothing. Zero dollars, zero won, zero yen, zero euro, zero pounds, zero ringgits. Nothing for a referral, right? So what we're talking about here is making more money and decreasing our costs at the same time. And so why do you have a gap? Why is that gap there? Well, maybe because referrals aren't part of your marketing plan. For a lot of people, referrals are kind of an afterthought. Maybe we'll call it the icing on the cake. But in my mind, referrals are the cake. Referrals are the way people want to meet you. And so we have to make it how we meet them, right? It's the way we do business because it's how people want to meet us. So this is what I call having a mindset, our thinking, our beliefs. Let's see if you have a referral mindset. Let's see if you have any mistaken assumptions around this. So do you believe that asking clients for referrals is safe or risky? Most people believe that asking for referrals is risky. That's why they don't do it. It's a limiting belief. You could be sitting with a client talking about their friend or colleague or sister or brother, a perfect opportunity for you to step into that equation and help somebody else, but you believe it's risky. So what happens? You don't do it. And you miss the opportunity to serve someone else and the opportunity to serve yourself. So what I try to do in my business to this morning and in the workshop this afternoon is for some of you flip that switch and you realize that it can be a very safe thing to do to ask for referrals and introductions. What is the lifetime value of your client? The lifetime value of your client is not just the business you could do with them over a lifetime, which can be substantial in some cases, but it's also who they can introduce you to over a lifetime. When you have a referral mindset, you pay attention to things differently. You start to see who else is in their life. You get genuinely curious. And then at some point, you may be able to serve those people as well. So we have to think in terms of the lifetime value of our client. Boy, I hope you're a giver of referrals. Finish this phrase for me. As you give, you receive. It's true in all aspects of our business, right? But to give a referral, to connect people, is there a little risk? Yeah, you never know exactly what's going to happen. So how are you going to create a culture of your clients giving you referrals on a regular basis if you're not willing to take that risk yourself and give and make connections? To get referrals, give referrals. Do you see the referral process as an extension of the service you provide your clients? This is where the belief in the work you do comes in, right? Don't make referrals about you and how you're trying to build your business or the old style method, I get paid through referrals. No, make it about them and the process you've taken them through and the value you've brought to them. That's why people give you referrals, because they see the value in the work you do, not because you're trying to build your business, right? Have you made a decision to grow your business based on how people want to meet you? Doesn't it make sense to build a business based on how our clients want to meet us? Well. Let me show you a quick study that was done in the United States of how, how people want to meet their financial professional. 84% of the folks you want to meet want to meet you from a referral, an introduction from someone else they already trust. 16% will meet you, meet you through other methodologies. Yet most people focus on the 16% when they should be focusing on the 84%. So my question for you here is, are you dabbling in referrals? I don't know what the translation of dabbling is into other language. Right? Are you dabbling in referrals 
or are you committed to building your business to referrals? Are you committed to meeting people the way they would prefer to meet you? And then I always have fun with this one. We can kind of fill in the blank. We have a room full of about 4,000 people. I blank to get referrals. Call it out. What fits here for you? Love to get referrals is always the first one that comes up, right? I heard someone say, I give to get referrals. Oh, that's good. That means you're paying attention, right? Sometimes someone will yell, I beg to get referrals. And I go, no, no, no. This is, this is a non-begging zone, right? Let's try this one on for size. I expect to get referrals. An attitude of expectation. Now, first of all, I don't recommend you say to clients or prospects, I expect you to give me referrals. That's not a good idea. But it's an attitude of confident awareness. Here's what I mean by this. You're confident in the work you do. You know you serve people well. You help them. That's the confidence. And then the awareness is the people that they know and the people that you can serve through them. Right? A referral mindset, confident awareness, attitude of expectation around referrals. Would you agree with me that if you expect a certain outcome to happen, you're more likely to create that outcome? Absolutely, right? Referral mindset. Let's make sure you're referable. I mean, if you want to get referrals, you've got to be referable, right? So how do you know you're referable? Well, everyone in this room, myself included, should be getting referrals without asking for them. I hope you're getting referrals without asking for them. That's a barometer of our referability, right? If you're not getting referrals without asking for them, there could be something missing in your initial process or how you stay in touch with your clients over time, right? It could be a reflection on how you're staying in touch with folks. So first of all, you want to have an initial process that's referable. You want to make sure you put them through a process of asking good questions, getting them thinking in ways they haven't thought before, right? Questioning their assumptions, teaching, educating. You are teachers, you are educators. Right? And from that, you become referable. Here's how you know you have a process that's referable. Have you ever been with a prospective client? They're not a client yet, they're a prospect. And you're asking good questions and you're teaching them things. And in the middle, they say, huh, I wonder if my sister or brother should do this. Or I wonder if my parents have done this. Or I wonder if my children are old enough. If you ever hear something like that, now you know your initial process is really bringing great value. You want people to refer the process that you put them through. Right? It's not the product. Your products do not make you referable. As important as they are, that's not what makes you referable. It's the initial process you put people through. And then having a client service promise, a client service model that helps you determine how often and for what reason you will be in touch with your clients. It's very important that you have it laid out, that you have a model, and your clients can feel that from you. They can tell whether you're kind of making it up as you go or whether you have a plan that you follow and how to stay in touch with them. And the two things that go into that plan, number one, you have to keep providing value. And I love what Colleen said yesterday about having different ways of coming to people. The telephone, in person, email. I don't know if anyone's using fax anymore, right? She mentioned that. But nonetheless, we keep bringing it. You look, your company produces all kinds of materials and literature that you can drip on your clients over time to provide value. And then business friendships, right? Here's what building a business friendship will do for you, for your clients. First of all, it shields you against the competition, shields your clients against the competition. We want our clients to like us, to trust us, to see the value so much that they'd feel guilty talking to another financial representative, right? And then what also happens is it turbocharges, it boosts your referrals, right? When people see the value that you bring to them and they like you and want to help you, well, you're unstoppable when it comes to referrals. So one strategy, one thing you can do to, to get referrals without even asking for them is what I call the value discussion, checking in with your clients uh, to make sure that everything's going okay, right? First of all, it'll reveal problems, if there are any. Harvard Business Review reported a study that said if a client does not rate you as completely satisfied, they're a candidate to move their business somewhere else. They didn't say mostly satisfied, they said completely satisfied. If there's a gap between where they are and where they'd like to be with you, you gotta fill in that gap. You gotta find out what that is, right? So it'll also bring the value to life. They get in touch with the value and you become referable. Yet, most businesses don't check in with their clients very much or their customers. Happens 
basically in two ways in my life. When I check out of a hotel, which is very frequent, people ask me, they say, Bill, where are you from? I go, Hyatt, Marriott, right? Sometimes I'm lucky enough to be a Four Seasons or Ritz-Carlton, right? Well, they say, how was your stay, right? Did you have a good, good stay with it? Or if I take my car into the shop, I get a call a couple days later, how was the service experience? People don't check in very much, but we miss a huge opportunity. So a few years ago, I decided to buy a hot tub, and I went to this place called Hydra Pool, and I met a young man named Alex, and I brought a copy of my book, Get More Referrals Now, and I gave it to Alex as a gift to my salesperson, right? He says, wow, nobody's ever brought me a gift before. This is nice. Uh, did you write this book? I go, oh, yeah. He says, get more referrals. Oh, I, I like referrals. I said, well, you should. They're important. He says, are you like a sales trainer or something? I said, well, in a manner of speaking, but I really teach referrals and introductions. He says, is this a test? And I go, no, Alex, let's just have a little fun in this process. OK, so we're talking hot tubs and sales and, and, and referrals and hot tubs and sales and referrals. And about 45 minutes later, Alex says to me, Bill, based on what we've been talking about, I think now would be a good time for me to go for the clothes. What do you think? Alex, give it a shot and see what happens. So I bought a hot tub. Took delivery on the hot tub, installation, everything's good. Never heard from Alex. Right? First of all, who's not going to be happy with a hot tub? Second of all, if there's one person on this planet you might ask for referrals, it's the guy who's written five books on the topic. Right? So why do people not check in? I think it's two reasons. Either one, they're, af they're afraid that something's not working and they don't want to hear negative feedback, which is obviously a bad perspective, right? Because if something's not working, you may lose a sale, you're certainly not referable, or they just haven't made it part of their process. Check in with your clients and make it part of the process. At an annual review, how are we doing? Anything not working? Anybody drop the ball, right? And then what is working? How have I earned your loyalty? And from this, this simple conversation, you will get referrals and introductions without even asking. And if you decide to ask, everything gets easier because they now have become in touch with the value. Now, it isn't a value telling. Don't go in and start telling them the value you've done for them. That's your story. Let them tell you the value, open-ended questions, and they get in touch with the value. And that's where the referrals start to flow. So in my workshop, which we're doing two this afternoon, I hope you come, um, we're going to talk about how to ask for referrals without pushing, without begging. Now there are some marketing gurus, some people out there that will tell you, don't ask for referrals, don't ask for introductions. And I'm here to tell you that that is bad advice. That is their own fear that they're just putting on you and doing you a disservice. We have to be referable. We have to provide great value. They have to trust us. And you know what? The level of trust to gain the sale might be here. The level of trust to gain referrals is up here. It's a higher level, isn't it? Right? So we have to be referable, and we have to be proactive. Because if here's a mistaken assumption. Some people believe if I just serve my clients really well, if I just do a great job, they'll give me referrals. That's half true. Some people will, and that's important, and that counts. But you don't always get enough, and they're not always the right people for your business, are they? So we also have to find a way to be proactive in a way that doesn't hurt the relationship, in fact, actually strengthens the relationship. So we're going to talk about five ways to promote referrals, to stimulate referrals without asking. We're, to, we're going to give you a four-step process for asking for referrals, and I've met a number of you here from Manual Life and AIA and a few other firms that are already using this system, and it would be great to have you at the workshop. And, and we're going to talk to you how to get out of the request. Look, not everyone wants to give you referrals, and we know that. Some will, some won't. So how do you back out with grace and with dignity? And then a seven-step formula to turn that referral into an introduction, right? Because the referral isn't enough anymore, is it? We need to get connected in introduction. So if you have any questions, just send an email to this address, 2014mdrt at referralcoach.com. That'll go straight to me through my website, right? 2014mdrt at referralcoach.com. I'll do my best to, to look at the questions between now and the workshop and, and weave some of those questions into the workshop. 
to make sure I make it as, as relevant and customized for you. And one of the things we're going to cover, I've kind of been known, known for this phrase I've been teaching, and for some reason this phrase translates all over the world. My, my host, Rajesh, said this, one of the, the best things that he, that he picked up from me when I spoke at MDRT in, in Atlanta in 2011, right? Really simple. Don't keep me a secret. Simple little thing, goes into their unconscious, and then later, right? They're talking to a friend, the colleague, a neighbor. Don't keep me secret, kicks in, and it turns into referrals. So referrals work in a lot of different parts of our life. I'll give you another example in my life. I'm a single guy, and as a single guy, every now and then I find myself out and about prospecting. I'm glad you think that's funny. <laughs> it's not easy. And going to a nightclub or a bar or something, I don't do that. That's like cold calling for a date, right? I don't do that. As you might imagine, I work on referrals. So a friend of mine, Al Lowry, is, is, uh, has, and his wife, Arabella, they have their eyes and ears open for someone for me to meet, right? And, and, and they were at a party on a Saturday night. We'll call Al a, a center of influence. <laughs> I tell Al that I pay a big commission for this sort of referral. So they met a woman named Sandy, and they thought I should know Sandy, and she should know me, and they tell her all about me, and vice versa. And he calls me up at close to midnight, Bill, I got a hot referral for you. Give it to me, Al. Her name is Sandy. She's, she's bright. She's intelligent. She's waiting for your call. You want to know why? No, Al, tell me why. Because I pre-sold her on you just like you told me how. I have a pre-sold prospect waiting for my call. Can you imagine the confidence I felt calling Sandy for the first time, knowing she was ready to do business with me? So to speak. <laughs> Sandy, this is Bill Case, Al Lowry, said it'd be okay to give you a call. Who? Well, you met Al at a party Saturday night. I think my name came up in conversation. I was at a party, but I don't recall anybody named Al. Oh, that's all right, Sandy. Al said you're in sales. I guess we can agree this referral call has just become a cold call. Yeah, I guess it has. Ooh, very cold, very fast. So I did what you would do. Sandy, that's fine. Can I send your brochure with some testimonial letters? When in doubt, mail information. Hey, I hope you found this helpful. And if you like this, come to the workshop. We'll see you then. Thank you very much. Thank you, MDRT. Thank you. Thank you.